So last week, we finished off talking about the different types of energy. Okay, so we talked about like chemical energy, and electrical, magnetic, nuclear, okay, mechanical. Um, and so where we're gonna go from there is looking at kind of transfers and movements and changes in energy, because that's kind of a big theme in this unit. Right, so what we're gonna be looking at today is thermodynamics. Okay. Thermodynamics deals with mechanical energy as well as thermal energy. Okay. Conversion of one to the other and kind of the movement of thermal energy okay, from one place to another because obviously the origin of that word is heat and change. Okay. Dynamic means changing and thermal means heat. So we're talking about changes in energy, changes in heat, movement of heat, things like that. All right, so um, first thing we have to understand is that there are laws of thermodynamics. Okay? The first law of thermodynamics is the law of conservation of energy. Okay? It says that energy can't be created and it can't be destroyed, very much like the law of conservation of matter. Okay? We can't create energy, we can't destroy it. We can convert it, we can transfer it, we can do all kinds of things with it, but there's always going to be the same amount. It's just not always going to be in the same form. So for example, my physics 20s are going to do a lab tomorrow where they're simply going to put a cart at the top of a ramp, calculate its energy there, and then let it go to the bottom of the ramp and calculate its energy there. In the perfect physical world, those two energies would be the same. Yeah, they'd be equal. The law of conservation of energy says that um, energy can't be created or it can't be destroyed. But in the real world, that doesn't work out. The energy at the bottom is not going to be equal to the energy at the top. But energy is still conserved. It's just not all conserved as mechanical energy. Some of it's going to get turned into what? Heat, sound, okay, stuff like that. The stuff that friction basically turns into. Okay, there's going to be some friction between the wheels and the ramp, and, and you know the, the bearings on the wheels are going to have some friction. All that stuff is going to result in some energy being lost. It's still there. It's just not in the original form. Okay, does everyone kind of follow? It's easy to sometimes say, oh, well, there's less energy, so some of it was destroyed. No, it's never destroyed. It just turns into something else. Okay? And that something else is sometimes hard to detect or kind of ascertain or measure. Okay? All right. Um, so we got to talk about systems first. Okay? So first off, the definition of a system is that it is a set of interconnected parts. Okay. And we kind of define where a system begins and ends. Right. So we could talk about this room being a thermodynamic system. Right. The parts of that system would be you, the air in the room, okay, and the walls. Right. Anything outside of this room would be considered the surroundings. Or I could say that each one of you is your own system, and this room is the surroundings. Okay? And energy is moving from you to the surroundings. Okay? Why is it only moving that way? We learned about this last week. Heat always flows from hot to cold. Your surroundings are 20 degrees Celsius. You are 37. Okay, so heat is naturally moving from you to the surroundings. Okay, now it's a fairly nice day outside. But usually when I teach this unit first semester, it's like December, and so it's freezing cold. You may have noticed sometimes when you come in here, it's cold. It's because I've never turned the heat on in this room. Unless it's like minus 35, then it'll turn on a little. Because, well, the thermostat sucks, and if it's on, it's all the way on, or it's all the way off. It doesn't seem to have anything in the middle. Okay. Um, so what I do is I use the laws of thermodynamics to heat this room. Okay. First semester, I always have a class of like 30 to 35 kids in period one. They very sufficiently heat that room up, okay. especially if they're writing an exam. There's a little bit of that panic sweat that happens. They get a little bit warmer because they're anxious. Okay. And the whole room can go up. Okay. If in June, this is what you guys are going to notice in June, when it's hot outside and you're in here in period three or period four, it's going to be hot in this room. So prepare. Okay? 
because the laws of thermodynamics work the wrong way then. Okay? This room just gets hot because the, the heat can't go outside. Okay? It's hotter outside than it is in here, so the heat can't go out, so it just stays. Okay? And it gets super hot in here. There's some days where I can come in here in the morning, it's 21 degrees in here, it's nice, it's comfortable. By the afternoon, it's 28 in here. I haven't had the heat on, it's just that people have come in here. Okay? And the laws of thermodynamics have been working all morning. And it gets really hot and gross in here. So prepare for that. If it's hot in June, that's what it's going to be like. All right. So system is a set of interconnected parts, and everything else is considered to be the surroundings. Okay. So the set of boundaries are arbitrary. We said you can change them. Okay. Um, the surroundings would be everything else. Okay. So if we had uh, a gasoline-powered lawnmower, okay, the system could be the engine and the surroundings would be the other parts of the mower, the ground and the air around the mower. Okay, energy would naturally flow from the engine to the surroundings. Okay. All right. There's three kinds of systems. Okay. The first and most common form of system is an open system. Okay. An open system exchanges both matter and energy with its surroundings. So, you are an open system, because right now you are exchanging matter, you're breathing, okay? so you're bringing in oxygen and giving off carbon dioxide, okay? so you're exchanging matter with the surroundings, and you're exchanging energy with the surroundings, okay? because you are 37 degrees and the surroundings are 20, okay? so you're giving off energy to the surroundings, you are an open system. Most systems are open systems. Okay. Second type of system is a closed system. That is one that cannot exchange matter, but can exchange energy with its surroundings. Closed systems are fairly easy to make. We just have to seal something airtight. Okay. If it's sealed off airtight, no matter can get in or out of the system, but energy can. So this would be like if you went to the grocery store and you bought something at the grocery store, meat or something or bread, okay, and you wanted to freeze it. Right? You would put it in a Ziploc container that seals it airtight so that nothing can get in or out, okay, and then you throw it in the freezer. Well, no matter is going to get in or out of that Ziploc bag, but the temperature of that food is going to go down because it's going to exchange energy with the freezer, okay? lose energy of the freezer, and eventually freeze salt. Okay, that sort of makes sense. Okay, so anything that is a closed system will not exchange matter, but will exchange energy. Okay, the last type of system is purely theoretical. Okay, it is impossible to create a perfectly isolated system. Not because it's difficult to stop the matter. The matter is easy. It's stopping the energy. To completely isolate something, it would not be allowed to exchange any type of energy with its surroundings. And that is impossible. Okay? To perfectly isolate something from its surroundings means it doesn't gain any energy and it doesn't lose any energy. And everything gains and loses energy. Okay? I often have people say, well, Mr. Coder, isn't, this, isn't the International Space Station an isolated system? My answer to that is no, it's a closed system. Okay, for the most part, it's a closed system. Okay, but even that, it's actually an open system because it does exchange matter with its surroundings. They bring food and water up to the space station, and every once in a while, they jettison the space toilet, and you get a poop coming. Okay, that comes down and burns up in the atmosphere. Okay, they're still exchanging matter with their surroundings, okay? uh, and they're certainly exchanging energy. They have solar panels all over it to generate electricity. Okay, so that's an intake of energy. And it's always losing heat to the vacuum of space. Right? Um, so it's, ex it's exchanging energy for sure. Okay, so it's not a perfectly isolated system. A perfectly isolated system would be completely undetectable. Okay, so if we had something in here that was a perfectly isolated system, I wouldn't even be able to see it because it wouldn't give off any light. Yeah, any energy, including light. Okay, um, so it'd be impossible to do that. Okay. 
Now, we say that, and then we do a whole bunch of questions that say, in an isolated system, this is going on, just because it simplifies things a great deal. Okay? So anytime they say there's an isolated system, it basically just means it's not going to lose or gain any energy. It's perfect in every way. All right, so first law of thermodynamics and, or I like to sometimes cross this out and say, is the law of conservation. Now, what we have to understand is that there is a difference between these two types of energy. Actually, neither one of those is a type of energy. They are both transfers of energy. Okay? So, work is a change in, delta means change, uh, mechanical energy. So it says here that work involves the movement of matter from one location to, a, to another. That's mechanical energy. It's potential. It's kinetic. <clears throat> All of that kind of stuff. Okay. Whereas heat is a transfer of thermal energy from one location to another. So something hot is giving energy to something colder. Right? So really, this whole first paragraph is kind of the fundamentals of thermodynamics, understanding that there are different types of energy that can be transferred. <clears throat> and so by that logic, there's two ways to change the energy of a system. Heat it up, that is transfer thermal energy to it, or cool it off, that is allow it to transfer thermal energy away. Okay? So that's the first way, a change in either in thermal energy. The second way to change the energy of an object or system is to do work on it, or have it do work. Okay? That would mean it's either going to gain or lose mechanical energy. Okay? So um, an example of that could be if you put um, a wind turbine up. Okay? When the wind is coming into the turbine, it's moving at, I don't know, let's say we're down to Pinscher Creek, 100 kilometers an hour. Okay? It hits the wind turbine and transfers some energy to the turbine, causing the turbine to spin. After the wind interacts with the turbine, is it still moving at 100 kilometers an hour? Nope, it's lost some energy. It did work on the turbine. Okay, so the wind system okay, has lost energy, or the turbine system has gained mechanical energy. It's had work done on it. Okay, everybody all right with that idea? Okay, um, so those are the, the two ways that, and, the system can change its energy, all right? So, if you put a hot metal rod into a bucket, are we looking at a change in thermal energy or a change in mechanical energy? Thermal, this is heat, okay? We're trans gonna transfer energy from the hot metal rod to the water, okay? The change in thermal energy, there's no change in mechanical energy going on here, other than maybe there's some bubbles or something, the water might move a little bit okay, when it evaporates. Right. What about the kid on the pogo stick? That's mechanical, because it's movement, right? It's movement from one place to another. The kid and the pogo stick are all moving, okay, and they're going from one place to another. So it's important to be able to kind of tell the difference by looking at a system and seeing what's happening to it. Okay? All right, so the first law of thermodynamics, okay? is really just a restatement of the law of conservation of energy. Okay? It states that the total energy, including heat in a system and its surroundings, remains constant. Now, if I add thermal energy or expose that system to heat, okay, that system will gain 
that thermal energy. One of two things will happen to the system. Though. Its temperature will go up, its, its thermal energy will increase, or it'll move faster. Okay? The heat could be converted into mechanical energy, okay? and the mechanical energy of the system would increase. Right? But they are going to be equal. Whatever I add to the system has to be accounted for. Okay? Otherwise, I'd be destroying the energy somewhere. So if we're talking about, let's say, an internal combustion engine. When you turn on the motor, gas is burnt in, in the cylinders. Okay? When that gas is ignited, okay, it explodes. We're, we're talking an internal combustion engine is a rapid series of small explosions going on thousands of times per minute. Okay? And so um, that explosion okay, heats up the air inside the cylinder very rapidly. And what do hot things do? They expand. Okay? So those gases inside the cylinder expand and they push the piston down. Okay? That's heat being turned into mechanical energy. The heat in that cylinder gets so great that it transfers and becomes mechanical energy that drives the piston down. The piston is then connected to the crank, which is connected to your drivetrain, which powers the wheels. Okay, kind of, that's a very simplified way of saying it, but that's essentially what goes on. In an internal combustion engine, we are doing exactly this. We are adding heat to a system, and it is turning into both mechanical energy and heat. Okay? In fact, an internal combustion engine is very inefficient, and lots of the heat we put in stays as heat, and it actually has to be removed by the cooling system of your car, or your car would overheat and melt down. Okay? So you have a whole system that involves circulating coolant through the block to take that heat away to keep the engine from overheating. Okay? That would be your coolant, your water pump, and your radiator okay? all working together. Is that making some sense? Now, the other thing that goes on is in most real world situations, there are moving parts. And when moving parts try to move past one another, there's always going to be what? Friction. Okay. Friction turns mechanical energy back into heat. Okay, we learned that with the guys boring up the cannons and having coffee breaks when they could boil the water on the cannon. Okay, mechanical energy can be turned into heat by friction, heat and sound, and sometimes even light. Okay. All right. Now, how many people have heard of a perpetual motion machine before? Okay, one that can run forever. Okay. There's this real fad of trying to make one for a very long time. Right? So a perpetual motion machine is supposed to be any machine that can run indefinitely with no input of energy. You get it going and it'll stay going forever. What's the problem with building one of those? Anytime energy is transferred or converted from one form to another, some of it is lost. No energy conversion is 100% efficient. So a perpetual motion machine would have to exist in an isolated system where it could never, ever lose any energy. And we know that isolated systems are impossible. Okay? That means that a perpetual motion machine is impossible. Can we make a really efficient machine? Can we make a perpetual motion machine? No. And here's the other part of that. Why would we even want to? What can a perpetual motion machine do? If I have a perpetual motion machine and I hook it up to something to power something else, what will happen? Think about what the definition of work is. Work is a transfer of what? Energy. Energy. So as soon as I make that perpetual motion machine do any work, what's going to happen to the perpetual motion machine? It's going to lose energy and stop. Because if it doesn't stop, I've come up with something better than a perpetual motion machine. 
I have become God, and I am creating energy against the laws of thermodynamics. Okay? We cannot break the laws of thermodynamics, therefore, the laws of thermodynamics forbid the creation of a perpetual motion machine. We can make super efficient machines that can run for a very long time, but even if we could make a perpetual motion machine, it would be utterly useless because it can't do any work. It can't do anything except run itself. It could never run something else because that would require it to create energy. Does everyone follow the logic there? Yeah. So people came up with all kinds of ideas for um, perpetual motion machines. Okay? Like this pie plate one. All right? So they thought if they had these curved like sections in here, that if you got this thing going, the balls would keep moving to the outer edges and keep it moving. So when, it, when the balls are going up, they roll towards the center. And then when they get over the top, they roll toward the edges, which would have gravity pulling on them more, accelerating one side, and this thing should run forever. Except it doesn't, obviously, because there's friction here at the pivot point. Okay? Every time one of these balls moves, does it make noise? Is sound a form of energy? Does that represent energy lost? So it's not going to run forever. You could make it really efficient. It might run for a long time. But as soon as you hooked something else to it, like put another wheel on it to try and power something, it would just stop. Okay? So it would be totally useless. I like this one. I think this one's got potential. But it's cheating. Why is it cheating? What is the magnet always doing? Is the magnet changing the energy of the balls? Then it's always doing what? Work. Okay. Now, you might say, well, you don't have to put any energy into the magnet. And my argument to that would be, a magnet doesn't last forever. It'll last for a very long time, but it doesn't last forever. Okay. Eventually, things lose their magnetism. Okay. They will always be magnetic. Okay. So that was a bit of a cheat. Plus, okay, yep, every time the ball comes up and falls through the hole, it comes back down here. But what does it have to do at the bottom of the ramp every time? It's got to lift this door. Is that going to make sound? Take energy to lift the door? Work. Okay. It's very difficult to find a way to make something go without losing any energy somewhere. Okay. All right, so the laws of thermodynamics. The first law says you can't create energy, and that means that a perpetual motion machine, even if you could make one, could never do any work because it would have to create energy to do it. So the first law forbids it, but so does the second law. Okay. The second law tells us that energy always flows from hot to cold or high to low. Okay, so it defines the direction energy must go. Okay, so the second law of thermodynamics describes the direction of energy flow. Okay, and it says heat always flows naturally from a hot object to a cold object, but never naturally from a cold object to a hot object. The word naturally is the key here. It doesn't do that naturally. Could I force it to? I could. Your cells do something similar all the time. Naturally, things want to go from high concentration to low concentration. But if I use energy, active transport, I can make them go the other way. Well. I can go against the second law of thermodynamics as long as I'm willing to use energy to do it. Your fridge and your air conditioner do this all the time. Okay? Your fridge and your air conditioner are what we call heat pumps. Okay? They pump heat from a cold area to a hot area against the second law of thermodynamics. They are also the two biggest consumers of electricity in your house takes a lot of energy to do that. Okay? You ever notice that hot air comes out from the bottom or the sides of your fridge? Okay? 
Where is that heat coming from? It's coming from inside the fridge. Okay? That's the heat that's being taken from the food inside your fridge to keep it cold. Okay? And it's taking it from the inside of your fridge, which is about 4 degrees Celsius, and pumping it out into the room at 20. Okay? So it's going against the second law, but it's using energy to do it. We'll talk about how heat pumps work here in a few minutes. Okay, so know the first and second laws. Always ask about those. Okay? That could easily be quiz material for tomorrow. Okay, so this whole idea that heat always flows in one direction and that that's predictable, okay, has been the source of a lot of engineering. Okay, trying to build engines that can do useful work. Okay, if we know that energy naturally flows from a hot spot to a cold spot, and we can put something in the middle, we can harness that natural flow of energy and use it to do work. Okay? This is how a hydroelectric dam works. Okay? We take water and we let it pile up behind a dam and give it lots of potential energy and then we let it fall over the turbines. Okay? We know the water has to go from an area of high potential energy to an area of low potential energy, so it's naturally going to flow over the turbines and we just harness that. Okay? We put something in between that it has to turn while it falls and we get energy for basically nothing. Okay? Does that sort of make sense everybody? Okay, we can do the same thing with heat. Okay, if we've got one area that's really hot and one area that's really cool, we know the heat's naturally going to go that way. Okay, if we put something in the middle, we can harness that flow. Okay, that idea is the idea behind the heat engine. Okay, a jet engine is a heat engine. Okay, where the fuel is being burned is extremely hot. The surroundings are, by comparison, extremely cold. Okay, even if they're 35 or 40 degrees, they're still extremely cold compared to where the kerosene is being burned. Okay? And all we do is put fan blades in the way so that as the heat, which carries air and matter along with it, tries to go from hot to cold, it turns these turbines and creates thrust. Okay? This is how a jet engine works. And the hotter you can make the hot area, the more thrust you can get. All right, so the first idea of this looks a bit ridiculous. Okay. This was the first idea for a heat engine. It would power a boat. Okay. And the idea was that you have warm water near the surface, because the sun hits that. So you know, if you're looking at the ocean, the water near the surface can be quite warm, but the water very deep down is still quite cold. Okay. Um, so you have this warm water area, and then you got a short pipe that's bringing in that warm water, and then you got this other area that's got cold water in it because you got this pipe that goes really, really deep and touches the cold water. Okay? The idea is that energy will want to flow from the warm water to the cold water, and as it goes across, it'll turn the turbine, which will generate propulsion. Okay? Now, is there a huge difference in temperature between the ocean water at the top and the ocean water at the bottom? Not really, maybe 30 degrees, okay? I mean, the, at the bottom of the ocean, it's not below freezing or the water would freeze, okay? So we know that it's you know, gonna be around zero at, the, at its coldest. So there's not a lot of temperature difference. And secondly, are the warm water and the cold water in the ocean already in contact with each other? So what's the motivation to go through the turbine? It's like saying to a mouse, here you are, Here's the mouse, and here's the cheese. Okay? You can either go straight to the cheese, or you can go through this maze and then get to the cheese. Which way is it going to go? Straight to the cheese. Okay, well, so is this. <laughs> and there's really nothing there to make that, make that actually work. It's a good theory. Okay? But in practice, the temperature difference isn't enough. Okay. So heat engines usually involve us having to generate a large amount of heat by burning something, okay, like kerosene in a jet engine or something like that. Okay, so with a heat engine, okay, so when the heat in a heat engine flows from high temperature to low temperature, that heat can be converted into mechanical energy, which can do work. 
okay? And then the remaining heat gets expelled simply as exhaust. Okay? We used the internal combustion engine as an example before. Okay? The fuel in the combustion chamber burns at a hot temperature. That causes the gases to expand and push the piston down. Same idea. Okay? We're still converting heat into mechanical energy. So, according to the second law of thermodynamics, heat never flows naturally from cold to hot, okay? But it can be made to do so, okay? You just have to do work to make that happen. Okay, so let's go back to your fridge example here. So, your fridge is the system. Your house is the surroundings. The fridge is taking heat from inside and is pumping it out into the surroundings, which are warmer. That's against the second law of thermodynamics. So your refrigerator is using energy to make that happen. So, could this work? Could I air condition my house by leaving the fridge doors open? Okay, why not? You're absolutely right, why not? Homer tried this on The Simpsons. Take the amount of work going into the fridge isn't enough to put all of them on it? Yeah, partially. Okay. I mean, first off, your fridge is designed to refrigerate 30 cubic feet of, of air, maybe. Okay. Not all the cubic feet in your house, which would be like hundreds or thousands of cubic feet. Okay. It's not designed, the compressor's not that big. But also, where is it pumping the heat? If I leave the doors open, it's now trying to cool the area it's pumping the heat into, right? So all that hot air comes up from underneath, right back into the fridge, okay? You're now trying to heat the area you were trying to, or trying to cool the area you were trying to pump the heat into. Your compressor will just run nonstop until it self-destructs, okay? It just won't work because you're just, it'll never catch up, okay? That's exactly what happened to Homer he tried to make an air conditioner out of his refrigerator. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that episode, but they find him in the kitchen with the doors on the fridge open and this sheet over the fridge. And he said, I noticed something. I came down to get a beer out of the fridge and I opened the fridge door and I discovered it was cold inside. So I left the doors open and I put this sheet here. But of course, all the fridge was doing was pumping the, the hot air into the area he had enclosed with the sheet. So it never shut off. It eventually just burned out same idea. You can't air condition your house with your refrigerator. Okay? Your air conditioner, if you have one, pumps the heat out into the surroundings outside of your house. Okay? So then it's not going to, it's going to stay going. Plus it's way bigger than the compressor on your fridge. Okay? That's why it usually um, needs a special plug-in. It runs at 220 okay? instead of 110. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about heat pumps then. Oh, sorry, I forgot to mention this. Um, we, we found this really cool place that my wife and I stayed and we had these, this uh, hot tub. And the hot tub was wood fired. Okay? And so it used the laws of thermodynamics. My wife actually kind of got bored with me explaining how the laws of thermodynamics were totally at work here. And I was because I'm a nerd, right? And I saw this and I'm like, oh! You gotta see this. You got cotton. So I started. To, I bought firewood and we started making this thing happen because it was so cool. So, in this furnace thing here, okay, there's water coming into it. Okay, so the the tub is full of water, and you can see that there's two pipes coming out of the tub. Okay, this pipe here on the bottom brings cold water into the heater. The one at the top, okay, puts hot water. Actually, sorry, it goes the other way. Get the hot water comes out and comes back in so that it creates a bit of a circulation inside the, the tub. Okay? So what, what there is inside of this heater is it's two layers. Okay? It's two tubes. The inner tube is where the fire is. The outer tube is the water. So as the fire burns, it heats the water. Now the water won't stay there. The water wants to escape. So it goes out through this tube and goes into the tub and pulls cold water from the bottom of the tub 
into the furnace and it just keeps circulating. There's no pump. Okay? This requires no like electrical energy to circulate the water. It simply runs on the fact that as you heat the water inside that heater, it's going to naturally create a convection current that's going to uh, circulate the water. Okay? Now, was it great? No. I burnt like three packs of wood, because okay? um, you can see it was quite cold out there, was still snow there, okay? in order to get the temperature of the water from about 5 degrees Celsius to like 38 degrees. Okay? And then we didn't realize that I had actually got the water too hot and we got in and almost turned into like shrimp. Okay? Um, and almost got cooked, so we had to then put the fire out and pour some cold water in afterwards. Okay? But it worked perfectly simply because it was using the laws of thermodynamics. Hot flows from hot to cold, from hot to cold. Okay? The cold from the tub would come back into the heater, the hot would flow out into the tub. Okay? Didn't require anything more than just to light the fire. Okay, now, heat engines and heat pumps, okay? So, jet engine is an example of a heat engine because it's got a hot area, the heat's naturally wanting to go from the hot area to the cold area, that creates thrust as it turns the, the jet blades, okay, or the turbine, okay? It sucks air in through the front, okay, and blows it out the back, okay, really super hot. Okay, now, a heat pump, on the other hand, takes heat from the, uh, from the cold area and uses energy to pump it into the warmer area. Okay? So a heat engine is sometimes called, um, well, if it runs on electricity, runs a thermoelectric converter like this. So if you had something like this, you could set this up and have hot water and cold water okay, and attach it to an electric motor. And the fact that this metal gets hotter faster than this would actually cause the energy to flow through the electric motor and power the motor. Now, how long would that run for? Right. It'll run slower and slower and slower and slower until the temperature equalizes and then it'll stop because there'll be no natural flow of thermal energy from hot to cold anymore. Okay. Now the other thing you have to consider is this is about the least efficient way you could set this up. Is it easier for the, like, for the heat to go through the bar and through the motor into this or to just go directly across from hot to cold? Right? I mean, there's going to be a lot of flow directly across from hot to cold. There's no insulation or anything there. And so it's naturally just going to go that way. All right. Um, yeah. All right. Now, heat pump. Like I said, your refrigerator is a heat pump. Okay, so here's how your fridge works. And you can underline those same things I've got underlined there. Okay. Um, So in the walls of your refrigerator, but not in the door, okay, just in the walls, um, are bits of copper tubing. Inside that copper tubing is the coolant okay, that cools the fridge. Okay. Now, that coolant is designed to change state from liquid to gas easily at the temperatures of your refrigerator. So what happens is, heat from your food goes to the coolant, because okay? the coolant is lower in energy. It's a cooler temperature than the food. So the heat naturally goes to the coolant. And when the coolant absorbs that thermal energy, it changes state from liquid to gas. Okay? And now that gas flows through the tubes to the compressor. The compressor is the part of the fridge you can hear running. Okay? And the compressor does exactly what its name would imply. It puts that gas under pressure. And if you take a gas and you put it under pressure, you can turn it back into a liquid. But when you do that, it has to release all the energy it gained when it changed from a liquid to a gas in the first place. Okay? So the compressor gets hot. Because as it compresses the, the, uh, the gas back into a liquid, the heat is released. Okay, so you've got a fan under there that's pumping that heat or blowing that hot air back out into the surroundings. Okay, it uses a lot of energy to create that pressure and turn that fan and get all that heat back out into the room. Okay, your air conditioner works the same way. Okay, it takes air from your house and runs it across coolant lines 
okay? That, that coolant then changes from a liquid to a gas, goes back to the compressor, gets recompressed. If you go outside on a hot day when your air conditioner is running, you can feel the heat coming off of your air conditioner. That's the heat from the inside of your house. Okay? It's just being pumped out to the outside. Okay? Everybody all right with that? All right, so the process is not natural, okay? You have to put work in to make this happen. Right, you got to put energy in in order to make the heat go from um, from cold to hot. Okay? It's like pumping water uphill. You have to put energy in to do it. Okay, so that thermal energy is then transferred to the air surrounding the refrigerator, okay? and the refrigerants pa uh, pump back to the condenser where it's cooled and reliquified. Okay, all right. I would like you guys to work on those questions right there. Okay. Give you a few minutes to work on those and then we'll have a look at them together. Okay, well, let's have a look at these uh, questions here. So, for question number two, state the first law of thermodynamics. What's the first law of thermodynamics? Cam? Yeah. Right, okay. The total amount of energy, including heat in a system and its surroundings, is going to remain constant. Or you could also write, energy cannot be created or destroyed. I would accept that as well. Okay? It is a restatement, after all, of the law of conservation of energy. Okay, what is the distinction between work and heat? This is probably the most important question in here. Hazel. Work is a change in mechanical energy, and heat is a change in thermal energy. Exactly. Couldn't have said it better myself. Okay, work is a change or a transfer of mechanical energy. Heat is a change or a transfer of thermal energy. And it's important to know they are both changes in energy or transfers of energy. It's the type of energy they change that is important. Okay, identify whether each of the following is best explained by the first or second law of thermodynamics. A bouncing ball eventually comes to rest on the floor. If it eventually comes to rest, is it losing energy? Okay, then that would not seem to be about the first law that says that energy is constant. Okay, so this must be about energy being transferred away. When you bounce a ball, it makes sound. The shape of the ball changes. Okay, there's some heat generated. Okay, that's all representing mechanical energy being lost by the ball, which is why each time it bounces, it doesn't bounce quite as high until eventually it just stops on the floor. Okay, it's the second law of thermodynamics. Energy goes from high energy to low energy. In this case, the surroundings get that energy. Okay, a metal spoon eventually becomes hot when placed in a pot of boiling water. Is the energy of the spoon changing? Then this is not about the first law, is it? Because the first law says it has to stay the same. Okay, this is about the second law. Energy is going from hot to cold, from the hot boiling water okay, to the cooler metal spoon. Incidentally, that's why you don't cook with a metal spoon. You can eat with a metal spoon, but don't cook with one. You'll burn your hands. Okay? Use an insulator like plastic or wood. C, energy cannot be created or destroyed. <laughs> that sounds familiar. First law. Yeah. Okay. All right, number seven, state the second law of thermodynamics. Energy flows naturally, naturally from a hot, object a hot object to a cold object or a high energy system to the surroundings, okay, something like that. All right, number nine is a bit tricky. It's a thinker. So you've all had this happen. You have a really cold drink and water starts to condense on the outside of the glass. Okay. Which way is energy flowing? Okay. The drink is really cold and water is condensing on the outside of it. Which way does heat naturally flow? To the cold. So just from that, just from knowing the second law of thermodynamics, energy must be flowing into the glass. Okay. The evidence of that is that water vapor, which has high energy, is turning back into a liquid when it touches the glass. 
It's condensing and forming liquid water. When that happens, a great deal of energy is released. So the more condensation you get on the outside of a cold glass, the warmer the liquid inside is going to get because it represents a lot of energy okay, um, being lost okay, by the water vapor and gained by the cold drink. Right? Everybody okay with that? Um, number 10, which law of thermodynamics best explains the following statements? You can't get something for nothing. Getting something for nothing seems like creating energy to me. I would say first law. Okay. You can't even get close. This is poorly worded. You can't even get close to getting something for nothing. Trick. Both. Okay. You can't get something for nothing. That's You can't create energy. But you can't even get close to that because energy wants to go away from any high energy object in the first place. Okay. And a rock will never suddenly jump into the air. Still first law. That would require me to create energy. Rocks don't jump. Okay? And I'm just going to jump into the air. Okay? That would require energy to be created. And that would be a very dangerous world okay, to live in if rocks just suddenly started jumping into the air on their own. Okay. All right. Plan for the week, guys, is this. Okay. Um, we're going to continue on with uh, energy. Well, actually, this will be kind of it for energy. We're going to start um, kinematics, which is like speed, velocity, distance, that kind of stuff. Hello. Hey. Yep. Yeah. Here. This is Baxter. Let's do the registration. You just take that. Um, so we'll start the. Um, speed and distance and time and all of that kind of stuff tomorrow and that'll probably take us till probably Thursday and then on Friday we'll probably start looking at graphing which if you've taken map 10 already is going to feel like we're the okay. y equals mx plus d stuff okay, which you've hopefully done already okay reminder that your plants uh, transport labs are due on Wednesday, so if you don't have those done already, make sure you get them done for 8.30 a.m. on Wednesday morning. You're more than welcome to come in at night time or after school or tomorrow. You have me look them over if you want. Okay?